Okay, welcome to chapter seven. We're going to be looking at negligence, strict liability, and strict liability. Kind of a joke, a poor one. Um, <sighs> this topic um, is going to play in, of course, to uh, what we talked about in the last one about uh, negligence. So I think it's very helpful if you haven't. Uh, to quickly review the four parts of negligence and how negligence works or negligence works in our legal system. And as I said, negligence is a uh, very common uh, basis for a lawsuit. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move in here and we got to uh, drop back and actually talk a little bit about modern markets. Um, the, the problem with a lot of business law I think it's fair to say, is it developed in a much earlier time where buyers and sellers often had relationships that extended back in time and were close geographically to one another. You often knew who you were buying from, knew who you were selling to. They were part of a community. I think what has happened as we've gone into the 20th and in particular the 21st century is you may know the kind of shell of who's selling you something. You may know, okay, I bought this from Amazon, or, um, or I bought this at Walmart. But you very often don't know the individual maker. You have no relationship to them. Um, so as that separation between buyer and seller uh, widened, we put less and less, uh, or we had less and less ability really to have an individual make certain judgments. So stepping into this breach, stepping into this problem is trying to hold people liable um, in situations that don't easily fit into the law that had been established previously. So we're going to look at cases where we have liability in the product, how it was made, how it was manufactured, how it was sold, or when people do things that are very dangerous, again, if you're an individual in, say, 1800, you can do some dangerous things. You can drive a wagon fast, or you can uh, let your hogs run loose. But if you're an individual in 2020, you can do some incredibly dangerous things, like try to blow up parts of a nuclear power plant, or uh, you know, shoot 47 people with an automatic weapon. Uh, so. We really need some new causes of action to deal with this new society that developed. So one of the things we look at is, is a person engaging in something which is abnormally dangerous? And if you engage in this activity, even if you take reasonable precautions, if someone's injured, we're going to hold you liable. And that and some product liability really go under strict liability. So that's why I had strict, strict liability. Okay, so what do you have to have to talk about uh, abnormally dangerous activities? Let's, let, let's take a practical example. Um, uh, you know, you could talk about, and I, I give the example, good example is blasting with explosives is abnormally dangerous. But let's talk about a, a, a dangerous wild animal. I have a friend of mine who is a uh, retired formal lion tamer. And uh, for years, he would get phone calls and I guess after this explosion on Netflix of uh, that silly, you know, documentary about uh, the crazy lion tamer down in Florida, um, he would get phone calls uh, about people who were keeping large cats, tigers and lions. And they would say, well, how, how can I do this safely? And Bill would answer, he goes, you can't. They're a wild animal. Well, I've, I've raised this from a cub. I, I know how to treat it. He goes, well, go ahead. You can, you can keep the animal, it's, it's lawful to own these, but be aware that it is a wild animal and it is very dangerous. So you create a strict liability situation. Let me, let me give you an extreme example here. You decide you want to keep a Siberian tiger, which is a four or 500 pound animal, and you put it in a concrete bunker in your backyard. And the concrete bunker has a steel door. And surrounding the steel door is a moat uh, that you can't cross. And surrounding that moat is a fence. And, and you electrify that fence. And let's suppose that little Timmy next door shorts out the fence, 
jumps the fence, swims across the moat, picks the lock, and goes in to pet the tiger and gets bit. you got liability. Because what we tell you is if you're going to engage in something very, very dangerous, like keeping a wild animal, then pretty much in any circumstance when someone gets injured, you're going to have liability. Now, product liability is something that probably impacts the individual consumer a little bit more than keeping wild animals. Or, or by the way, let me, let me just backtrack one second here to that previous slide. One case where I think it could happen to you is if you kept a domestic animal that you knew was dangerous. You might have heard the legal maximum, every dog has his day or every dog gets one bite. If you have a dog that has never bitten anybody and it bites someone, it's going to be a standard negligence situation. But if you have a dog that has bitten people and you determine, well, I'm going to keep that dog because I, I like that dog. Well, the next time that dog bites someone, even if that person was roughhousing with the dog or, you know, act, you got strict liability. If you keep a domestic animal that you know is dangerous, you have strict liability. All right, let's talk about product liability. So, as I said, you've got this real separation in the marketplace. You don't know who designed a product. You don't know who, who what materials they selected. You don't know how they put it together. Um, so you're just kind of trusting the marketplace to produce something. So product liability is based on people making mistakes at some point in a process over which you would have no way to easily see where they're screwing up. So here's your examples. How did you design the product? What materials did you select to build the product? How did you put it together? What warnings did you put? What inspection and testing did you do? Now, one of the interesting things, and we're going to introduce a term called privity here. Privity is the original contractual relationship between a buyer and a seller, is that product liability doesn't require it. So if I make an unsafe car and you buy that car, yes, you have a cause of action against me because I sold you an unsafe car. But if that car's brakes fails and it runs over a pedestrian, that pedestrian can sue me, even though I wasn't in contract with that pedestrian. I didn't sell the car to the pedestrian. Doesn't matter. No privity is necessary. So um, let, let's let, let's use a practical example here. Um, about thirty years ago or so, um, they made a car. Um, called the Pinto. Uh, and what they, when they were designing the car, they made a fundamental error. They located the gas tank in a bad position. The result of which was the gas tank would rupture and sometimes in rear end collisions at relatively so slow speeds and it would blow up. People would burn to death. When people turned around to sue Ford, I believe made the Pinto, um, they sued under product liability and said, this is a badly designed. Now, sometimes you have things that you select the wrong materials for. So you, you've got a good design, but you decide, well, instead of using uh, this type of steel, I'm going to use this type, and it fails. And then sometimes you, you've got the right design, you've got the right materials, but you decide, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to assemble it in a, in a very good manner. I'm going to find the cheapest way I can put it together, and that's good. Again, you can create liability there. Of course, you have to have adequate warnings. One of the ways you can avoid getting sued is if you can put a warning and say, this thing is dangerous. Also, inspecting and testing. All right, so let's go on to misrepresentation. Now, this shifts the claim to more fraud. So you misrepresent a material fact about the product that can create liability. Now, strict li public liability. This is where we say we don't care if you exercise reasonable care. What we care about is, is the public injured? Now, why would you have this? Well, because sometimes we have an injury. We have someone who made something and if you don't have a way for the injured party to recover, the society is going to suffer. So essentially you're saying consumers have the right to be protected from unsafe product. And the makers and the sellers 
of these have more of a more of a duty of care than the buyers. And we first started to see these as early as 1962 in a case called Greenman versus Cuba. Uh, what do you have to have to have a strict product liability? Okay, a product must have had some defect when it was sold. The defendant must be normally engaged in buying and selling it. The product must be unreasonably dangerous because of this defect. The plaintiff must incur injury. The defect must have been the cause of the injury. And the person who bought it can't have changed it. So it's still a dangerous thing that's being sold. They took some precautions, but it's still dangerous. So how do you prove a defective condition? I don't need to show how. I just need to show it was defective. Sometimes it's unreasonably dangerous. Now, dangerous products always carry risks, but when do we go to unreasonable? Well, the big thing we look at is, is there a less dangerous alternative? Let's go back to our Pinto. Can you, you know, you buy a Pinto, you don't know that the gas tank's located improperly. There's no way for you to determine that. Um, when they made it, it was an error. They didn't think about it, or they thought about it poorly, or the, but you have an expectation that cars won't blow up when they're hit from behind at relatively low speeds. So they violated that. That makes it unreasonably dangerous. Now the question is, does that mean any automobile that gets hit from behind has um, a liability issue? And the answer is no, because there is, there's no way to completely avoid, if you're dealing with a gasoline engine, the possibility of a rupture of that tank. But you can ask, what's an economically feasible alternative? Well, one would be locate the tank in such a manner that it's not dangerous. And that's a perfectly reasonable alternative. So it becomes defective then if you don't protect it. All right, so you can have manufacturing defects. This is it. Sometimes you're making something, you've got a good product, but they don't make it properly. Um, so contamination of a drug would be an example here. Sometimes there is a dangerous design. You always need to show, though, that there is a reasonable alternative that is safe if you're going to claim product defect. So you also look at, well, how dangerous it is, what is the probability of dangerous, and what are the relative advantages and disadvantages, because there is going to have to be some trade-off versus efficacy of something you're making and cost. I can make a much, much safer car, but it might cost $200,000 and no one's going to buy it. So at some point you have to say, okay, yeah, you could make this car out of titanium, um, but it's unsupportable. So yeah, we're gonna have to stick with steel. Uh, adequate warnings. You need to tell people if there's a risk. So you know sometimes it's an obvious risk, but you still put the warning in to protect yourself. My favorite example of this is Q-tips. Almost everybody on the planet, when you have a Q-tip, you use it to do what? Clean out your ears. Well, if you look on it, it, it'll tell you don't because you can puncture your eardrum. You don't know how far you're going to put it in, even though everybody does it. So we can ask what kind of warning is put there. Could you sue Q-tip because you put the Q-tip in your ear and punch your eardrum? The answer is going to be no, not under product liability. Um, but if you made something that could easily be misused and you didn't provide adequate warning, then yes, there could be liability here. Um, but you have to be able to foresee the misuse. Let me give you a quick example here. Uh, lawnmowers. There was a case where this was a push lawnmower. And you've all seen a push lawnmower. You've got the, the small engine. It drives a blade uh, and you push it along. So these two guys said, you know, you got a spinning blade and it's it's cutting a, a flat uh, plane. So we've got to trim these hedges. Let, let's do this. Let's pick up the mower. I'll hold it in the front. We'll turn it on its side and we'll walk, walk along the hedge and we'll trim the mower that way. We'll trim it. And they did this. But unfortunately, being idiots, um, the mower eventually would hit a branch or a stick or something and it would kick because the blade's not going to cut through anything that's over a certain diameter of wood. 
Well, when it does that, the energy of the spinning, basic physics, has to be transferred someplace. It's going to be transferred into the frame. You're going to lose control of it. And now you've dropped a mower that you were holding and moving in relation to, and you've got a spinning blade of death. And people cut themselves. So they sued lawnmower manufacturers. And lawnmower manufacturers said, it's really not foreseeable that you would do this. And they won those suits. But just to protect themselves, what they did was they put stickers on the lawnmowers and in the manual saying, you know, use this to cut grass, don't use it to cut hedges. All right, now let's talk about market share liability and product liability issues. Sometimes you can't determine who made a defective good, particularly if it's an old injury. So I'll give you a, a practical example here. Years and years and years ago, uh, there was an anti-nausea medicine that was prescribed to pregnant women. So let's suppose it's 20 years ago when this is being done. And let's suppose there are five firms, A, B, C, uh, D, E, that make this drug. They sell it. They make it. 20 years later, the daughters of women who took this pill began to develop a very unique form of cancer. And with a little bit of research, they determined, oh, guess what? Um, this cancer, very rare cancer, has to have come from when these women ingested this pill 20 years ago and damaged uh, the, their, their daughters in the womb. So essentially it was a long-term poison or genetic damaging that triggered a, a very poor womb of cancer. Okay, horrible situation. So these women developed cancer. Okay, remember there are five firms, A, B, C, D, E. Well, who sold your mother that drug? Was it Pfizer? Was it Bayer? Was it Glaxo? Is your mother going to remember? Do we even have those records? You may have a record of a doctor that says, take this drug. The odds you're not going to have a record at the pharmacy that says, this is the drug you took. Um, so you can sue everybody who back in that market was doing it. So let's suppose Pfizer had 40% of the market and Glaxo had 20% of the market and Bayer had 10% and the others had other percentages. Then they would all pay into a fund and when you sued, you would recover a proportional share of their contribution. Now, what are the defenses to product liability? Well, one, preemption. The government comes in and settles the risk. This happened for tobacco companies. Tobacco companies got themselves in trouble. Tobacco um, had been very successful for a long time defending uh, the cancer-causing nature of tobacco smoke. And then uh, the data started to come out that, first of all, they knew that it caused cancer, which was bad. But the second thing that really hurt them was the addictive nature of nicotine, because they'd done a series of studies and they determined that they needed so much nicotine to keep people addicted, physically addicted to cigarettes. And during some of the processing of tobacco to render it into cigarettes, some of that nicotine was taken out. So they put back in enough to keep people addicted. And when juries started hearing this, tobacco companies started losing. So they go to the government and they say, we're really losing. Um, tell you what we'll do. Um, we will pay a massive amount of money. And the government will, will say, okay, these lawsuits are settled. People can file and collect some of this money. You'll give some of the money to help us pay for people who get lung cancer. But basically, no more product liability suits against tobacco companies. And that's essentially what they did. Now, one of the defenses tobacco had used, ironically, was the second one, assumption of risk. And this is kind of funny, particularly for tobacco, because in the 1960s, you're never going to guess what magazine really did the most damage to uh, tobacco companies, Reader's Digest. They were a very popular magazine, and they published, um, and it, it had been in medical literature for years, in Journal of American Medicine and New England Journal of Medicine, that tobacco smoke caused cancer, lung cancer. It was pretty well established, but, but tobacco companies had fought and fought and fought and fought. This article comes out, eventually the government decides, you're going to have to put a sticker on your tobacco packs that say, 
this can cause cancer, this can cause low birth weights, this can cause all these problems. They fought it tooth and nail, they lost, it goes on. Well, in a few years, they started to say, yeah, well, you're, you're suing us because you got cancer, but hey, stickers are on the packs, you know these things. Now that worked, particularly for a while, because remember, um, nobody knew about adding the nicotine back. Once you knew, um, well, we need to keep them addicted, doesn't matter if they know because then they're physically addictive, that really got rid of their assumption of risk defense. The other major defense here to talk about for product liability is product misuse. Did you get a product and use it for something very different than what it was intended for? So uh, an example here can be drugs. Sometimes drugs are prescribed for one thing, but people take them to do something else. If you use it in a way that's clearly not intended, that can be a defense. But if it's a reasonable use, then the product misuse is not a great defense. Kind of go back to the Q-tip there. Uh, comparative negligence, we all know what that is. You're partially negligent yourself. Commonly known danger is a defense. Knowledgeable user, you know, did you know enough about this? Those can be defenses. Now, these next two terms are important to define. Statute of limitations, statute of repose. Statute of limitations says, um, from the time of the sale to the point of reasonable discovery, or statute of repose from the time of manufacturing. Because sometimes you say, it's been so long that I, I should be able to defend myself. Sometimes you say, well, no, um, it's got to be from when the defect was discovered. So take, say, a defective inflatable raft that you would use on a boat. So it's supposed to save your life. Would you run it? And let's suppose it was manufactured 20 years ago. So your yacht is sinking. You go, you, you take out your survival kit, you pull it, it doesn't inflate. And it turns out that it was poorly manufactured. Well, it was 20 years ago. Can you sue? Do we run it from the time of the manufacturer or do we, we run it from the time of reasonable discovery? All good questions. Okay, this chapter, a little bit shorter than the others. Uh, we will pick up with uh, chapter eight, which is intellectual property, uh, which is a pretty interesting one. We'll do that in uh, whenever you're ready. Just click on chapter eight.